Hi everyone, this is Ellen Carlin. I think we will go ahead and get started. Thanks very much for joining me here today. I am a Senior Health and Policy Specialist with EcoHealth Alliance, and I'd like to talk to you today for a few minutes about science policy and how science can be used to support domestic and global health security policy decisions. So um, this is just a quick overview of what we'll cover. We'll talk a little bit about what science policy is. We'll speak to the ways that science can support the government, can support policy, and the ways that the government or policy can support science. And throughout, I'll give you some examples about how EcoHealth Alliance uses science to encourage and support good policy. This, of course, will be a high-level overview. We only have about 15 minutes or so, um, and I'll tend to focus more on the global health side than the domestic picture. Of course, you can feel free to ask me questions at the end about either. Um, but the idea is to give you a sense of the places where science meets policy, and then just to offer my perspective on, on where I see science and um, pandemic science in particular going in the next few years. So I want to talk about science and policy today at the highest levels of government. So in the United States, this would be executive branch agencies and Congress. So over on the left, you see a picture of the White House. The president, of course, has purview over all executive branch agencies, such as the Defense Department, the Health Department, um, et cetera. Uh, in the center, that's the Capitol building representing the US Congress, which makes authorizations and appropriations decisions. Basically, they make the laws and they provide the money. And then the judicial branch does weigh in on science policy matters, um, including the Supreme Court and some of the lower courts. But most of the time, those of us who work in science policy uh, will be operating at the executive and legislative levels. So that's kind of what we'll be speaking to today. While most of my examples will be based on U.S. governance and U.S. policy, because that's where I've, I've done a lot of my own policy work over the last decade, the principles of science and policy are applicable to all nations and all governing bodies. So World Health Organization, for instance, operates with the input of advisory groups of independent experts. These are technical experts, scientists, physicians who, who who meet and they um, they gather their thoughts on pertinent technical topics that the World Health Organization needs to understand in order to promulgate good policy. And so the example on the screen is an example of um, a report they developed on variola virus research. That would be smallpox um, in which the WHO is, is very invested. So um, other organizations you see on your screen, the OIE, the FAO, they too, of course, operate with the input of technical and scientific experts to help make their policy decisions. What are we talking about when we say science policy? I think the term is used a lot, but maybe not ever completely defined. So um, I think it can mean different things, and I, I personally think of it in two main ways. One is policy for science. So this would be the promulgation of policies and or funding to support scientific activity. And then kind of the, the converse would be science for policy. And this would be using science to inform policy making. So an example of the former, um, this photo is taken at the NIH. Um, at NIAID, and that's the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease. And what you see here is the um, a, a staff research science scientist giving a presentation to the president because the president and, and the Congress um, are always thinking every year about what what research should we support at the NIH and and how much funding should we give it? So this you know this kind of shows a nice example of just one area among many in which the the federal government supports science. 
And then, you know, on the flip side, I think an example that most of us who've ever flown on commercial airlines in the United States can understand is the, the 311 rule, that the three ounces, you know, we all need to keep our carry-on um, toiletries to, to three ounces of liquids or gels. Otherwise, they have to get tossed before they go on the plane. And believe it or not, this is based on science. It might be classified science, but it was science, um, explosive science that went into trying to mitigate mitigate um, the threat and the risk uh, from explosives getting onto commercial airliners. And so um, that's, that, that is an example of how underlying science can support um, really prominent federal decisions and policies and regulations. Let's talk um, for a few minutes about um, the, that first topic, which is policy for science. So um, this is an example of a pie chart from the fiscal year 17 budget request. This is not the current year. Actually, yesterday, um, the FY19 budget request just came out. So this is slightly dated. But in general, this pie chart is representative of the overall research and development um, budget of the federal government. And what you see here is about $147 billion for R&D doesn't necessarily include correlate activities like capacity building, for example, or emergency response to pandemics. This is sort of your, your basic R&D across the federal government. Now, why does the federal government invest all of this money across all of these agencies in research? Well, there's a few reasons. For one, the government really knows that investments in R&D are an important driver of economic growth. Um, so it's not just $147 billion in. There are billions of dollars out because much of the work that you see here is outsourced to the private sector, for example, through um, intramural grants from the NIH or from contracts let out by HHS and DOD to pharmaceutical companies to develop medical countermeasures. In addition, of course, many, if not most of these programs directly benefit government operations in some way. Um, at DOD, for example, investments in science can help protect the warfighter, whether on the battlefield or during humanitarian missions to areas impacted by infectious diseases. So this kind of becomes a circular loop then of policies that support science, which in turn support policy. Um, that's how you end up with TSA regulations or with um, you know, Ebola vaccines that reach the market um, that have been backed by early stage NIH research. This second graph, and my apologies to any colorblind viewers, there, there are a lot of um, colors here, but really the, the takeaway from this slide is just to see um, the, this top line. Um, I'm not, I think you can see my cursor. This, the, the, t the, the highest line on the graph shows um, NIH biomedical research. Um, and I, I just wanted to give you a sense of the, the level of investment in different types of R&D and how high um, investment in the life sciences is, which probably everyone on this call cares um, a lot about. And it's been on an upward trajectory far above the other categories for over two decades now. Um, and the president just yesterday proposed a sizable plus up to the NIH budget for the coming fiscal year. Last graph, I promise. I just wanted to include this to show that other countries also understand how important this investment is. Um, you see here a graph that I pulled off of the UNESCO website, where the blue represents the United States since 2010 and the orange is China. Um, you see a, a, a slow decline of US investment um, that's federal investment um, and uh, uh, an in increase in China's investment in R&D. We often hear how China is beginning to outpace the U.S. in its investment in science and technology. Um, and you can kind of see that revealed here in this graph. This is a pretty cool interactive 
interactive tool that you can find on the UNESCO website. Um, so I encourage you to check that out for your own countries or countries that you, you work in or travel to frequently. It might be revealing. So let's now take a look at the other side of the equation, which is science for policy. Those investments um, and policy and, and all the political decisions that are wrapped up in creating those investments that I just talked about, these in turn enable the creation of valuable scientific information, which can feed back into more policy making. Um, this is an example here from EcoHealth Alliance, where we're interested in science in a variety of fields particularly the science of pandemics. This is a global hotspot map developed by some of my colleagues here um, at EcoHealth, in large part due to, to some of those investments made by those federal decision makers. Um, you know, realizing that the emergence of infectious disease and the emergence of zoonoses in particular is really a major national security issue, um, the US government and indeed many governments um, are looking to understand the drivers of disease emergence. So from this map, you can see that zoonotic emerging infectious disease risk is elevated in forested tropical re regions, in regions where biodiversity is high, where land use change is prominent. And so, so enabling this kind of science can help improve surveillance, improve monitoring programs, um, and of course, it aids the government decision making to invest in those programs. So what arms of the government would, would want to make decisions to invest? Um, well, there are, there are a lot of agencies that, that care about this, this problem of pandemics. Um, this list that you see here is certainly not exhaustive, but it represents a few of the key players domestically um, and some of the, the governing bodies internationally that have a large stake um, in, in dealing with preventing and responding to pandemics. So um, this first one on the list here is the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID. Let's just take a quick close peek at USAID. This is a quasi-independent arm of the State Department. You can see it over here um, in this org chart on the, on the upper left. Um, the, the mission of USAID is to, quote, end extreme poverty and to promote resilient democratic societies. USAID does this through a variety of means, um, one of which is to train community members in developing countries in animal health skills, like vaccinating local livestock. Um, their, you know, em emerging pandemic threats program, which we at Eagle Health work closely with, really seeks to understand where, when, and how microbial threats are spilling out of animal populations and into people. Um, so that map that you saw before and some of the prior iterations um, of that map over the years have revealed that equatorial Africa and Southeast Asia are likely areas of emergence. Um, and this is why PREDICT um, and some other programs are focused on sampling in those regions. Uh, you can see here um, this, this map showing over the last eight years or so where PREDICT 1 and PREDICT 2 surveillance and sampling activities are occurring. Um, this, is, this is targeted sampling at those hotspots. Um, and on the bottom right of the map, you can see um, all of the implementers of this program. EcoHealth is, is but one. Um, and we're all working together to gather the data needed to tease apart our understanding of risk, which can then be used to make more strategic decisions about investing in global health security. Um, a quick example just from, from DOD next. You know, DOD operates uh, research and reference laboratories ac across the globe. DOD deploys support personnel on humanitarian missions as they did during the West Africa Ebola outbreak in, in 2014. And in order to understand the, the threats that their personnel face in those areas, um, they need to do research. 
one of the organizations within DOD that we work closely with is DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Um, and these are just a few um, photos and examples of the kind of work that we do to support DITRA. On the upper left, um, that's one of our staff scientists working in South Africa on a Rift Valley fever project, trying to understand um, the dynamics of rift in livestock. Um, we do work in Malaysia, that's on the right, kind of conducting serological biosurveillance for spillover of uh, viruses like Nipah. And most recently, um, sorry, Kevin, I don't have a picture of you on here, but this is a, a photo of a bat just to um, demonstrate that we're working in Western Asia to understand the risk of bat-borne zoonotic diseases there. So, what happens to all of this science? Well, really the, the idea is that we take a lot of this science and it goes directly back into the agencies for their own decision making. But we also use kind of the our body of science and, and other science that's been developed um, outside of eco health to support a large body of policy work that, that we do. Um, you know, for, for example, some of um, a couple of my colleagues at Eco Health Alliance have worked with the World Bank. Um, they've just released an operational framework, essentially for One Health. How do how do countries strengthen um, their public health systems at that interface of the humans, animals, and the environment? And so this is an operational framework to um, enable them to do that. We also issue policy recommendations. Um, some of our science scientists support the Blue Ribbon Study Panel on Biodefense as technical advisors. This, this is a group of former um, policymakers who are working to identify challenges in domestic um, biodefense and in global health security um, and to develop recommendations for the president and, and Congress on, on how we can improve them. And it's they're all grounded in, in science. Um, we, we, we read all about um, biosurveillance science and the science of medical countermeasures, the sciences of what's possible now and of what might be possible in 10 years if we invest. We look closely at issues like agricultural defense. How do we protect our livestock here in the United States from um, viruses that may be spread by migratory wild birds? This figure here on the bottom left, um, published in a peer reviewed journal by one of our science scientists, but it doesn't just stop there. We then take this figure and we use it to kind of discuss the return on investment you can get if you're able to intervene here on the lower left side of the graph, rather than all the way over here on the, on the response side after it's too late to prevent or to mitigate. So when used correctly, these types of publications can be very important tools for further policy development, um, for investment, and for oper operationalizing public health systems in a One Health framework. Um, and, and lastly, I, I just wanted to talk about translating into policy the importance of science communication for the lay community. Um, it's not just about um, talking to other scientists at in exec the executive branch who might understand the science. It's about talking to policymakers who typically don't have science backgrounds and also talking to their constituents, to the public. This is an example. This is just a clip um, from an op-ed that one of our scientists published in the Daily News. Um, this is a publication that a lot of people read, and at the end of the day, members of Congress represent members of the public, so that kind of public education really matters to us. So lastly, I'm, I'm happy to take questions, but I wanted to just offer my, my brief perspective on uh, what I think the outlook is for science investment and for global health security investment and, and 
biodefense investment. Um, I, Cause I know a, a lot of folks have been talking lately about, well, we have all this science, we've invested in it, but is, is it going, is that going to be sustained? Um, I, I personally believe that investing in the science of biodefense and, and of pandemic prevention will, will be important to the current US administration and, and to other nations and governing bodies. As some of you may know, the, the president's budget request was just released yesterday, and I'm actually still reading through it. Um, but I think what you see in that document is the, the drafters of it trying to strike, strike a balance between fiscal constraint, because resources are finite, along with an acknowledgement that global health security is local security and that we do need to um, fight diseases at their source. Overall, I think there is far better understanding today than there was even a few years ago that investment, advanced investment is necessary and that it must be sustained. Um, that being said, I don't believe we're yet ready yet for the big outbreak, um, but I do believe that we have leaders who understand that we have to get there. Um, you know, governments are run by human beings and humans have a tendency to be reactionary rather than proactive. So it remains incumbent on all of us to keep advocating for uh, prevention and preparedness science. Um, that is my brief overview about science policy and pandemics. And with that, I'd be more than happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Well, seeing no questions, um, I'll let you all go. I know it's lunchtime, but um, I didn't include my email on the slides, but if anyone would like to send me an email to follow up, it is carlin at ecohealthalliance.org. Thanks very much.